Hello and welcome. In this lecture, we're going to be talking a little bit about ecosystems and the way that we anticipate them being influenced by climate change going forward. Um, so I'm going to start off by talking about this more broadly in terms of sort of the state of the way that ecosystems are being influenced. And then we're going to focus in on some of the impacts that we anticipate seeing in Washington state. So when we think about the globe, it is uh, it is an amazing space on Earth. You know, there are so many different types of ecosystems, from ecosystems of the ocean to ecosystems of land, uh, to you know the many species that live flying through the air, you know, or on, living on ice. Uh, there is so many different types of spaces wherein species have adapted to very specific climates, very specific uh, locations and develop within a very distinct network of other species that they interact with in order to survive. And these chains of interactions are incredibly complex and, and fascinating. Uh, in fact, we very often we study a, a distinct species individually, but the truth is, is that um, you know, species interact with one another in these complex ways that we're only beginning to understand in, in many cases. So we are currently in the midst of the Anthropocene. Um, now, this is a term that has been used to describe the impact of humanity on the globe and on life across the globe. And this relates to the idea that we humanity is essentially causing the sixth great extinction. Um, there are other extinctions from meteors or other uh, major disasters that killed off large swaths of life on the planet. And we are sort of the sixth one. Um, currently, we see that uh, the extinction rate uh, on the, around the globe is about 1,000 to 10,000 times higher than the baseline extinction rate that you expect normally throughout uh, global history. So um, their, their humanity is having a very large impact. Now, when we look at this uh, in terms of nature, um, there's been a lot of loss of nature since human civilization started impacting uh, regional ecosystems. So uh, we see about uh, an 80 percent loss in land land animals. We see a, a, a similar loss in, in marine mammals, uh, plants, uh, major loss uh, in, uh, from human human influence. Fish less so, but substantial. And these are just a few different examples of these types of impacts. Uh, there, you know, there's insect species, for example, where there's a lot of concern. We don't pay as much attention to insects uh, as we do to, for example, wild land animals, which get lots of documentaries about them, right? But insects are incredibly important to ecosystems, and uh, it looks like they're really suffering. Uh, some counts suggest that uh, numbers of insects have reduced. Uh, you know, to fairly small percentages of what they used to be uh, in certain climates and, and regions. And uh, very popular species like butterflies, you know, they're looking at about half of them being substantially endangered and uh, experiencing very, very distinct losses. So um, there's many, many species out there, many of which we don't know that much about. So for uh, insect species, for example, I think we only know, we've only identified uh, something around 10% of them. Uh, there's a lot of them, we, we just don't even know what they are yet. We haven't identified them yet. So um, there are, there's a lot of interesting questions there to think about in terms of human impacts. Now, um, when it comes to climate change, we're still trying to understand what the impact of climate change will be, but we anticipate that it will be substantial. So a lot of these, uh, these species are not as capable of picking up and moving to another location uh, if you know the climate changes substantially. So uh, for example, species have um, adapted to specific lakes uh, if those lakes dry up, they may not be able to move to another lake, especially if they're fish, right? So the point here being that climate change is likely to have substantial impact on biodiversity and extinctions as well. And just as a recent example of that, in the, the, the wildfires that are going on now in Australia, they've been estimating that there's been at least 
uh, 100 species are at substantial risk of extinction, if not extinct, as it due to this. And some estimates that include insects and other species suggest that that might be more around 700 or so. So, um, we're, this is a th that's an example of how climate change could dramatically increase this impact on biodiversity loss. Now, when we think about human impact, I've already hinted at that in terms of loss generally, but I think that this is a helpful um, diagram based on a study that looked at essentially life by mass in the globe. Now, um, here is just a picture of what the tiniest component of each of these squares is. So we're going to look at life as a whole uh, and the mass of life. But um, in each of those squares, there's a certain number of cows in that squares being shown in, the, in, those in that grid. So that just gives you an idea of the mass that's being represented there. Now, um, humanity, uh, actually, when we think about the overall mass of life on the planet, humanity doesn't actually account for a whole lot of that mass. Uh, the vast majority of mass, uh, life mass on the planet is actually plants. So that's about 83%. And then we have bacteria and fungi and a few other uh, species that are um, making major contributions to that mass as well. Um, so humans themselves are not a huge contributor to that overall mass, about 0.01%. However, when we look at this in uh, the perspective of, uh, of life, uh, vertebrate life especially, uh, in on the planet, um, humans make up actually a very large chunk of that. So here we see a diagram where you see humans, uh, livestock, and then wild mammals and wild birds, all right, at the bottom. So what we're seeing here is that almost a third of the mass of vertebrate land animals um, is humans. Um, then Almost another two thirds is made up of livestock that we um, that we maintain to provide food for humans, and then wildlife, wild mammals, and wild birds together make up about five percent of the mass uh, of species. Um, I think that this was a, a very astonishing number for me to realize because I think that we just assume that there's a lot of wildlife out there that we just don't see that's you know, out in the wilds that we that's just hidden away. But I think that we miss the extent to which these wildlife systems are actually incredibly fragile because they've really been pushed into the margin such that there are only about five percent of that 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 mass out there. Um, so um, I, I found this sort of a helpful way of of thinking about the reality of what we're facing in terms of those ecosystems that we're working with. So, as I've mentioned before, nature has these really complex interacting webs, most of which we don't yet understand or, or recognize. Um, this is just a picture of the wildebeest and the wildebeest mi migration. Well, the wildebeest migration happens throughout Africa, um, where they travel hundreds of miles through, throughout Africa um, during their, their annual migration. And um, what's interesting is that during this migration, a lot of them die crossing the rivers. Well, it turns out that they provide about half the food for uh, a large period of the year for the um, for the wildlife within the liver, uh, the rivers because of the dead carcasses that they provide there. Now, what happens if climate change influences the migration pattern? We're seeing uh, climate migration, uh, climate shifts in migration uh, for birds, for a wide range of different species uh, because of these shifts in temperature. So what's going to happen there? There's other, um, there are other complex webs that we um, that might be influences between insects, between, um, you know, wildlife here in the United States. Um, and these, these interactions um, are important. We find that uh, ecosystems that are more biodiverse are better at absorbing carbon. Um, they tend to be healthier and more robust. Uh, so the destruction of that biodiversity really makes a, a more fragile e ecosystems. So do we need wildlife? So if the rhinoceros disappeared, if uh, the snow leopard disappeared, um, if um, you know, we had these impacts on wildlife, what would that mean? Well, 
you know, we, we definitely need some pollinators uh, for our agricultural systems. Um, other than that, you know, a lot of these species, if they disappeared um, incrementally, um, we could probably live without them for a fair bit of time. And that would work possibly for a while. But ultimately, when we're thinking about the health of these complex systems, this would catch up to us. Um, and the ways in which it kept catch up to us are unpredictable because we just don't, don't entirely understand those trophic ca cascades um, and complex ecosystem relationships. I think an interesting other sort of perspective on this is uh, a larger conversation that happens within the environmental field, uh, which really relates to the question of what is our moral obligation to nature and to wildlife? Do Does wildlife have a right or some sort of claim, moral claim, to exist on this planet? And do we should we be responsible for making sure that we restrain humanity so that wildlife can continue to exist and nature, uh, you know, plants and animals can continue to exist uh, successfully and thrive. And there's, uh, you know, there's conversation, uh, there's been proposals that we should set aside half of the earth for wildlife to be a preserve. Now, there's a lot of conversation about that, but it's sort of a cha challenging idea. You know, what would it mean if we put half of the land on earth aside for wildlife and, and half the oceans too? Um, what would that mean for the resilience and strength of our ecosystems and the possible ways in which that can influence the way that climate change evolves for, for um, going into the future? So for those who don't feel like, um, you know, trees and, and wildlife has an actual moral claim to to space and to time. And, you know, there are certain uh, ethical frameworks where that is a consistent belief uh, that, that, that they don't have that moral claim, um, whether you agree with that or not. Um, it's still important to note that even from the most pragmatic perspective, um, ecosystems are incredibly important to people living, to, to our well-being. Um, there's been estimates about what we call ecosystem services, which are essentially the ways in which, you know, wetlands or other uh, plant life, for example, filters out water so that we have clean water to drink, um, or the ways in which, um, you know, bees or insects pollinate uh, our agri agricultural in agricultural systems, right? Um, and when you actually start adding up all these important things that uh, ecosystems do, that wildlife does. Uh, that plant life does, um, it actually turns out to be incredibly expensive if we were to try and do that using technology on our own without those ecosystem impacts and uh, ecosystem contributions and services. Um, and there's been estimates that suggest that our GDP um, you know, goes down by about 10% per year because of the destruction of these ecosystems, right? And the, the, the loss of the services that they, they provide. And when you compare that $50 trillion per year that ecosystems provide to the overall uh, um, global world product, uh, not gross, gross, gross world product, which is sort of the global equivalent to gross domestic product, um, you know, that turns out to be a, a, a very large chunk of our, our whole um, uh, um, global world, um, gross world product, right? So uh, the point here is that if we take seriously the, the contributions that ecosystems provide to our well-being and health, that we would really take seriously the different strategies that we can use to protect um, our ecosystems. All right, so when we talk about the ways in which climate change is influencing e ecosystems, there's a lot to talk about there. And, um, you know, I, I could go on and on about these impacts. I've talked about um, how about 93% of energy gets absorbed by the oceans, right? So uh, that's in, uh, influencing a wide range of different things. We, uh, we're seeing that uh, if we have a two degree increase in temperature, they're anticipating a near complete loss of coral, um, coral, coral reefs. Coral reefs is a distinct system, uh, ecosystem. Um, and to think about the fact that the globe would actually lose an entire ecosystem is a kind of astonishing thought that an entire 
ecosystem would be obliterated is a is uh, really sobering. Um, when we think about um, fish and uh, fish life, fish life is typically doing a little bit better than land uh, life. But um, we then we're we're anticipating that um, with climate change, that uh, the algae and planktons that fish uh, uh, survive on will be migrating away from um, the equator because of the increase in temperature. And some fish might be able to follow and other fish may not be able to follow. Um, and there's a lot of people in the, in the equator that rely on fish to survive, right? So there's really important uh, factors there. And then we have these influences on current uh, that are, are occurring around the globe where um, it's, uh, you know, there's, we don't really entirely understand how this is working. There's some data suggesting that some of these currents are increasing in speed and some that they're slowing down in speed. And there's a lot of concern about what that will happen to the global distribution of temperature uh, going forward and the ways that ecosystems can survive, survive um, and the way that it will impact different areas. For example, the reason that um, England is relatively warm, uh, Great Britain is uh, relatively warm, uh, is that there, there is a current that brings warm water up into that area. And if that shifted, um, that the, all the ecosystems in the UK would be substantially influenced, right? So these are, these are changes that are occurring across the globe. We have the rainforest, you know, the rainforest in the last decade has lost 20, uh, what's it? Uh, 24 million acres, uh, uh, square miles of, of forest. It's about, um, it turns out to be about a third of the size of Washington state uh, has been lost in the last decade in the, in the rainforest. Um, uh, since 1970, it's about 80% of the size that it used to be. So, you know, these are incredibly complex systems that are uh, have been responsible for absorbing a tremendous amount of carbon. Uh, we also see major wetland loss. Wetlands actually absorb more carbon than the rainforest does. So, um, you know, these are these are real serious problems across the globe that we're that we're facing. So, what are we seeing in Washington State? I think that it's helpful to sort of take this big picture question and focus in a little bit in terms of what we might see locally, because there's also opportunities to work on ecosystem restoration in our area and think about what we can do to protect them. So um, one of the major things to recognize, and we'll just start with water, is that the water in the Northwest is changing. So it's increasing in temperature, um, it's acidifying, and there's a decrease in dissolved oxygen in a lot of the, the water, uh, Puget Sound uh, and the general region. So these, these factors relate to one another. Um, so the acidification, so as we warm, um, we see that certain types of things grow better. So we see Alexandrium, uh, which is a, a type of plankton, uh, is is really taking off. And sometimes it can produce toxic impacts. So uh, the growth period, uh, period has increased by about 30 days, uh, will increase by about 30 days by 2040. So we can expect certain things like that, the, these planktons, to actually to increase. And as you have more toxic plantains, what, what happens to our ecosystems? Uh, we've also seen uh, with these increases in, in temperatures, uh, major algae blooms, uh, which are um, in some cases really toxic. So this is a two, uh, picture of the 2015 algae bloom that really shut down fisheries uh, due to the neurotoxins produced all the way from Alaska down to, to, uh, to, to Mexico. So these can be really big impacts and these are largely influenced by uh, climate change related factors. So a major issue uh, for the Pacific Northwest. Um, ocean acidification is a really big issue. So uh, we expect that there will be a substantial decline uh, in uh, ground fish in our, our regional uh, waters. And partly this is due to, um, to a destruction of uh, wildlife lower down in, in the uh, ecosystem. So because the waters have become more acidic, um, about 10 to 40 percent more acidic since uh, the 1800s, um, uh, shellfish, crabs, a lot of other ocean life 
um, has more trouble forming shells. And we're seeing a dramatic drop off in, in populations in the Pacific Northwest. Um, now, what is this acidification? It's, it's important to note because acidification has uh, su substantial impacts to ocean life. Um, basically, uh, oceans absorb about 30% of the carbon that gets emitted. So it absorbs a lot of that. And as carbon dioxide uh, gets absorbed, the water becomes more and more acidic. Um, so uh, this is really important. And we don't entirely understand all of the impacts here. We see some with shellfish. We, it's the same sort of effect that's causing the, the die off of the coral reefs, that acidification, but it's also likely to cause other strange things. So uh, fish, for example, partially uh, function through smell uh, in the water and uh, carbon dioxide, uh, dissolved carbon dioxide acidification may influence fishes, fish abil the ability of fish to actually smell and, for example, predator fish to find fish to feed on, right? So there's, there's these complex relationships that we don't entirely understand yet, but that are, that are concerning. Um, we also are seeing uh, the increase in temperature having an influence on our wetlands that ha that occur that both but will both occur for freshwater uh, wetlands, uh, but uh, saltwater wetlands are some of them will increase and some of them will decrease. Um, uh, it seems like there this will vary, but um, there is reason to be concerned about how. Um, wetlands will be influenced in our area. And as I've mentioned, wetlands are really important for carbon capture. Um, we also find that the increase in temperature are having substantial impacts on, on fish, uh, uh, fish that are uh, go into fresh water and uh, uh, go up into uh, the mountains through our rivers, uh, salmon in particular. Uh, so we're finding that the increase in temperatures in, in the rivers are killing off a lot of salmon. Uh, so there's major concerns there. We also see those those temperature concerns for orcas, for example. So a lot of iconic uh, species in the area are really uh, being challenged by by these increases in temperature. Um, we see that a lot of species here are some species that we know uh, may be uh, impacted and are at risk due to climate change uh, in terms of the, uh, the the land area that they have that uh, will work for them. So uh, as tundra regions are disappearing uh, or being limited, we find that wolverines, uh, the marten, the pika um, are being are suffering as a result of that. Um, we see the spotted owl and the merlet, uh, who primarily live in old growth forests, are suffering due to the destruction of old growth forests. And then the cascade frogs, for example, are, are struggling right now because of um, the, uh, the ways that uh, um, lakes are, are drying up and uh, our, our current water systems. So, uh, and uh, which are being influenced by climate change. So uh, there's there's a range of species that are really at risk in our area. Um, uh, in addition to that, you could also think, speak about bird species. So we uh, have about 90, 90 threatened or endangered birds uh, in the area that are at risk of losing habitat by 2050 due to climate change. So, um, so they're, you know, we're, we're seeing this across wildlife species. Um, we can also think as we go inland uh, about the impact on forests. So uh, we have a forestry industry that uh, relies on these trees and we also want these trees for uh, ecosystem health. Um, and uh, we are seeing substantial impacts here. So <coughs> um, we expect that as climate change occurs and as temperatures increase, that we'll see a substantial decrease in the range in which uh, Douglas firs can survive and live. Um, we're also uh, concerned because yellow cedars, for example, uh, don't seem to do very well in uh, warmer climates. So we can expect those types of impacts on, on forests. Um, there's also uh, concerns around the ways that forests are influenced by, by mountain and pine beetles uh, and other insects and pests. So um, 
I'm going to talk a little bit about this example because this gets back to the idea that is talking about how ecosystems are complex relationships um, where um, different factors influence one another. So uh, when you have higher winter temperatures, uh, more be beetles will survive until the next uh, through milder winters. So there'll be higher populations in the following year. If there's a longer warm summer, what can happen is that these beetles can actually not just have one cycle of life, but they can have two life cycles throughout the summer. Uh, and if that can allow them to inf uh, uh, infest more trees and uh, lead to more uh, tree loss. Um, because of warming temperatures, these beetles can also expand their range to trees uh, and uh, ecosystems that they couldn't reach before. And as you have impacts of uh, increased temperatures, a lot of trees can be stressed by drought, and therefore that makes them more vulnerable to these beetles uh, and more, more difficult for them to fight off. So this is just one small example of how climate change interacts with multiple species interacting with one, with one another, leading to um, impacts on ecosystems. But again, remember these ecosystems have larger impacts. So when you have more trees dying from uh, beetle infestations, you have a much higher wildfire risk, right? So, and we know that wildfires have uh, multiple uh, health-related challenges for for our area in terms of air quality and in terms of risk of the fire the fires themselves, right? So these are just a few examples of some of the research that's come out about the way in which our ecosystems are being impacted by climate change and are anticipated to in the future. Um, and I, I think that it's helpful to keep this in mind as we think about this, although the focus of what I've been talking about generally has been on human health and impacts on humans, uh, it's also important to recognize that ecosystems are such an important part of uh, human success. We do not live and are not independent from the ecosystems that we live in. Uh, we often might think that that's the case, but we are very much dependent on those ecosystems. And um, it's uh, really crucial that we take seriously the ways in which we can uh, develop strategies for protecting those ecosystems uh, and uh, decreasing our impact uh, through uh, both our, our actions through industry and our actions through exacerbating climate change. All right, so thank you very much for listening. I hope that that's helpful for thinking about these issues. Um, so take care and be well.